Because when we talked to each other back then, nobody actually knew why they chose Vilcabamba. <laughs> because, uh, but it was a, it's this a special magic of this uh, valley here. Nobody can describe what it is, but it works, you know. So at that time, there's still is the is the main mode of transportation in Vilcabamba still horse at that time. Back then, it was only horses yeah. and donkeys. Yeah. Uh, I know. M my local friends, you know, they rode, like in a Wild West movie, they yeah. rode with a horse into the main square, tied, it, tied up. it up and went for a beer, went for grocery shopping, you know, that right. was so, uh, what, yeah. um, what was the infrastructure like then? So we talked about the roads, but I mean, was there electricity in most places in Vilcabamba at that time? Was there, I assume there was not internet, but I don't know. Um, what was that kind of stuff like back then? Oh, yeah, okay. the hotel we opened in 2001, and until 2001, we had no telephone number. We needed to wait six years only to get a number, but then we had no cable up here. <laughs> so actually, we never had a real phone up here. Much less, there were no taxi companies. Mm. Uh, I still remember the first taxis when they started to operate. They were 30 year old pickup trucks. You know, there were no regulation. It was impossible. It was really impossible uh, because you needed to walk around. You needed to talk to people in Spanish if they know maybe someone who is willing to uh, to sell. So, uh, yeah. Let, let me just uh, give an anecdote on that. So even when I got here in 2013, mm -hmm. Vilcabamba had a few real estate offices who, and they had whatever inventory they had. But outside of Vilcabamba, anywhere around here, that's how you looked for property. Like you, you the taxi drivers might know. Yeah, but some course. store owners yeah, yeah. might some store owners might know. But basically you just had to go into these towns and talk to people. And exactly as you said, it had to do it the old way, you know, because there was no way around it. And uh, but luckily we only needed to look at a few places, um, properties uh, before uh, we found an old farmer and he was uh, the caretaker of that place here we are sitting now. Uh, it's the passion. Yeah. You know, uh, I never would have thought that, but uh, because the idea of building a hotel was to sustain our life, yeah. But actually, we we like what we do, you know, and we do it now since uh, 23 years uh, with the hotel. I love to be around people, and it's so interesting. Yet. Hello and welcome back to an, another episode of Expat Life Ecuador. Jesse, joined today by Peter. Very excited for this interview. Peter is as close as you can get to an OG um, in Vilcabamba. <laughs> He's been here considerably longer than I have, considerably longer than really most foreigners in this town. So Peter has seen more happen, can speak more globally over a longer timeline uh, to Vilcabamba and his life here than just about anybody. There's probably only a handful of people that, that are still here, who have been, been here longer than he has. Um, Peter is the proprietor of Ishkailuma, which is a absolutely beautiful, in my opinion, uh, the best place to stay in Vilcabamba. It's a gorgeous sort of eco hotel, eco resort, um, looks out over the valley as you can see we're sitting here sort of just up above the restaurant the restaurant also looks out over the valley we're just a couple of minutes out of town uh, has a pool and a, and a spa and a really a lovely place to stay it just it also just what I always tell people when they ask me and I'm I'm you know recommending them options I always just say it just feels great at Ishkailuma you know it just you kind of walk in here you there's the no stress sign in the front and you kind of feel it, you know, you just feel really good here. So anyways, Peter, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and... Uh... Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Jesse, and welcome back to Ishkaluma. I still do remember the day when you showed up at uh, our hotel the first time, only as a guest, uh, before you decided to move here. Um, yeah, we are here already since uh, 25 years now. 25 I, years. Yeah, 25 years I came together uh, with my brother and we decided to stay here because we fell actually in love with the valley so we um, uh, yeah it was almost love in the first sight I arrived um, at Vilcabamba it was this magic light around 5 30 6 p.m. Uh, they call it here Sol de Venado 
uh, son of the deer and that uh, gives a special touch to the valley. It puts it into different colors, very soft, a little bit like in Africa it seems then uh, when the sun sets. So, and I saw the first time the Mandango Mountain. I don't know in the camera if you can see it, it's just behind us. Yeah. It's like our sacred mountain uh, for Vilcabamba. And I saw the mountain the first time and I simply had a feeling, a gut feeling. It felt like coming home. It was like, wow, that is the place uh, I'm looking for. And that even without knowing the place, you know, I was just entering the first time. And that was, yeah, back in 97. 97, wow. So obviously a ton has changed since then. I definitely want to get into that stuff, but let's jump back a second just so people get a sense of kind of who you are. So you're German by, by birth, by... It's by, not my fault. By yes, but, yeah. <laughs> so, so you're in... Talk a little bit about what your life was like prior to, to Ishkai Luma and Vilcabamba. Were you in Germany? Were you traveling? Um, yeah, I was born in Germany, uh, better said in Bavaria, a little bit north of Munich. Uh, Munich, very famous for the Oktoberfest, you know, the beer drinking guys with lederhosen, that's us, yeah. yeah. And actually, I, I like Germany until today. Uh, so I grew up there and um, I don't want to talk too much. Um, so in the age of 20, I did my first backpack journey uh, and it led me to Mexico. Um, it was very randomly, only because a, a work colleague of mine invited me to come and yeah, so I joined him. But it was the first time that I uh, got into touch with the Latin American mentality. And that's for me how I always describe it, it's the mentality of manana. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, uh, because manana means tomorrow and that simply is uh, people here not only in Mexico, also in South America, here in Ecuador, they take life a little bit slower. Yeah. And that was actually the opposite of Germany, because uh, as you guys know, Germany is famous for being punctual. Uh, and actually I was always like, okay, I think that it's more my culture here, the Latin culture with a manana uh, mentality. So yeah, with 20 I fell in love also with the mentality of them, as I told you. Uh, but I was 20, I was young, I had no money, and, but uh, there my first dream arose and that was uh, to open a beach bar at the Pacific uh, coast of Mexico. You know, I was young, you know, I wanted yeah. to party and uh, yeah, uh, like many, many other young uh, guys too, I guess. So I went back to Germany and then I joined the German Navy actually, you know, okay. for four years. I was a soldier, I was a sergeant on a German minesweeper. What years was that more or less? Uh, that was, I was in Mexico in uh, year 90 okay. and then I joined the Navy from 91 till 96. And um, in my mind I always followed the dream that I wanted to go to Mexico, but I also knew that before I make the move and the decision I uh, need to speak Spanish. Because for me uh, it's, a, it's a very logical step if you really want to go and live in another place that you want to be a part of the, um, of the local community so, and uh, interaction language is one of the most important things. So I decided I would start in Argentina in South America and travel one year through South America. Uh, and during that journey, uh, studying Spanish, learning Spanish. And so um, I went also to Chile, uh, Peru, Bolivia after Argentina. And then I came to Ecuador. Uh, I stayed for three months in Ecuador and, because and it's amazing And this is still in country. your 20s you're doing this? Yes, uh, no. this was actually after the Navy. I was 25 years old or young, I would say. Yeah. Great, um, time, great time for an adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then I came to Ecuador and Ecuador changed my mind completely uh, because it was actually that what I, what I was looking for. Uh, and it became not a beach bar, but our eco resort here. So yeah. tell me a little bit, and you shared, you may not want to share some of this on camera, that's up to you, but you shared a little bit about your story kind of getting to Vilcabamba and discovering this valley. Talk, talk to you a little bit what that was like. So you've been through now, I guess, probably Chile and Argentina and Peru and some countries like that perhaps at this point. Are you moving north, I assume? You hit Ecuador. Somehow you find 
Vilcabamba, which I'd mm -hmm. be curious how you even knew to come here at that time. I, yeah, that's funny. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then what was it like, you know, sort of coming into the valley and what, what were your first impressions? Okay, yeah, no problem with sharing that. Uh, um, it was actually already in Argentina, in northern Argentina, that I heard the first time about Ecuador and about Vilcabamba. And um, I didn't even know that there was another country between uh, Peru and uh, Colombia, because as you know, Ecuador for South American standards, it's a small country. And, but I got a recommendation to study Spanish. Yep. Yeah, the pronunciation is very good in comparison to uh, Argentina, Chile. Uh, I attended a, a language school in Santiago de Chile and it was horrible. <laughs> it was, if you want to study English and you would go to Australia or to Ireland or something, yeah, because right. they speak uh, differently. Um, so, yeah, they recommended me Vilcabamba for one reason, and the reason was if you want to try uh, the San Pedro cactus. Uh, that's a psychedelic uh, drug, or they call it nowadays plant medicine. Mm -hmm. And I've never ever in my life did drugs. Uh, when I smoked something, I always fell asleep. So, But it seemed uh, very interesting, what the stories, what they told me about, what happens during those ceremonies. And that was actually uh, the main reason I came to Vilcabamba. Uh, and then I was surprised by the beauty of the valley. So I was only backpacking through. I had planned to stay three, four nights, mm -hmm. attending one ceremony. Then uh, the three, four nights, it became two weeks. And then I came back here. Yeah. So l let me ask you, at that time, and we're Forgive me if I didn't keep track well of the timeline, but we're still in the mid 90s at this we point. We are still in the same year after my uh, Navy time because I, um, I left the Navy and a week later I um, took the plane to Argentina and it um, was only four or five months. So we're talking about the year 97. 97, okay. 97 um, when I arrived to Ecuador and to Vilcabamba the first time. So. Go, going back to that era, um, you know, obviously, like I, I got here in 2013. I've done almost no traveling to South Latin America outside of that. So I had been to Venezuela in maybe 2004, five, six, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. and I have been to Ecuador in 2013. I have no more history than that, other than terrible depictions in Hollywood, which are not accurate, <laughs> right? So, so go, let's go back to that time, the 90s into the 2000s. You, you know, you're showing up here in 97. What does Vilcabamba look like in 1997? Yeah, of course, uh, it was different like now, uh, as we can imagine, because every morning I look into the mirror and my face is different too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, so how was Vilcabamba? It was smaller, much smaller, because when you look down now, I mean, it's still small it's, uh, and I like it the way it is. Um, but back then in 97, from here, you only could see the church tower, actually. Okay. Uh, the rest, uh, all the roofs you see now, they were not there. Also, wow. the whole houses here you see now, um, also they were not here. And uh, so it was much smaller. The, uh, the streets, they were only around the main square cobblestone. And many of the streets uh, inside the center of Vilcabamba were like, uh, how do you say it in English? Dirt. Uh, dirt roads yeah. or dirt streets. Uh, very dusty also mm -hmm. in the dry season. That has changed uh, to the positive. Um, also the transportation, there was uh, only um, buses going between uh, Vilcabamba and Loja. Or, uh, capital was, of the was Loja that province. was the Vilcabamba Loja Road still dirt at that time? No, no, that was that was, uh, paved. That was paved. That was okay. the new road, and uh, though we were one of the earlier uh, foreigners living here, I the, I think when we arrived, there were maybe uh, 35, 40 foreigners living already. 35 or 40 at that 40 time. 40 at yeah. that time. How uh, many? Just out of curiosity, do you know how many of them are still here? And. You know, Gavino is still here. Yeah, sure. uh, some of them, they died, actually. Right, of um, course, yeah. You know, uh, Greg, for example, the book exchange. And we all knew each other, you right, know. And right. also, the, we all spoke Spanish in between each other. Felicia is still here. Yeah. So I would say from the old, uh, the, yeah, still 15, 20 are still around here. Yeah. Uh, 
And there's one uh, interesting thing, uh, like I want to, or how I would say it, interesting. Because when we talked to each other back then, nobody actually knew why they chose Vilcabamba. <laughs> Because, uh, but it was, a, it's this a special magic of this uh, valley here. Nobody can describe what it is, but it works, you know. I can see it with my guests here at the Eco Resort. We had just an example. They, they're leaving today, a um, Belgian filmmaker and componist uh, for music. They arrived the first day completely stressed and a little bit pissed uh, from the flight because also New York was too stressful. So the first uh, two days, they were really uh, not very pleasant people, I would say. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the magic of Vilcabamba and Ishkaluma started to work and now they are leaving. They have a smile on their face. They are completely relaxed. They actually don't want to leave, right. <laughs> but work is calling. So that is this special magic of Vilcabamba nobody can, uh, can explain. Um, so because there's no special reason I chose Vilcabamba. It was really only... You can call it intuition, gut feeling, yeah. Yeah. So at that time, so the road was paved, Loja to Vilcabamba, but then I believe it kind of ended yeah, the, at Vilcabamba. Yes, it wasn't, yeah. It was uh, paved uh, until the center of Vilcabamba and then it ended. Also, here passing by the eco resort here is, it was only a small dirt road. And Time was different back then because we had no watches or something and there were only two buses a day going down to the south because south of Vilcabamba, as you know, is the Peruvian border. And uh, so we had only two buses a day and I still remember asking my brother, um, hey, Dieter, do you know what time it is? And then, yeah, it's not nine yet. I couldn't hear the bus. <laughs> <laughs> because the valley was so quiet. Yeah. And the night sky, unbelievable. I yeah. fell in love with the southern hemisphere night sky. It has, I think, in my opinion, the double or triple amount of stars like it in the northern hemisphere. It seems that way hemisphere. to me as well, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So the, uh, the Milky Way, it's so bright here. No, no, it's excellent, yeah. Yeah. Um, also back there in 97, um, Life is always challenging, as I say, you know. Um, and also back in the days, there were challenges. Uh, because uh, Ecuador and Peru, they were actually enemy countries right. and they signed uh, the peace treaty only in the year 99. So, that was in 99, okay. Yeah. And that and was right after that, the currency collapsed. Yes, so then we had a uh, hyperinflation, that's true. What was that like when you, I guess you lived through that here? What, what, yeah, what you... uh, we came here in the Sucre, that's the name yeah. of the old currency. And again, you know, I, it was interesting. You know, for me, also a reason why I left Germany, it seemed too boring, too mm -hmm. organized. <laughs> uh, everything was functioning well. Um, so when I came to Ecuador, it was, everything was an adventure. Yeah. I mean, there were, you can call it problems. I saw it as challenging. I was like, wow, that's great. Here's always something going on. You know, we have volcanoes. Sometimes we have uh, earthquakes. Thanks God, not here in Vilcabamba. Because I don't know if you know, but uh, so far since the Spanish came to Ecuador, uh, there's not one reported earthquake for Vilcabamba. We can feel it when it shakes in other parts, but not here. The epic center never was here in Vilcabamba. Yeah. So, but something is always going on. And then we had uh, strikes, uh, we had uh, military coups, we had political coups. Uh, the first time when they throw, threw out our president, my mom called from Germany. Wow, wow, Peter, in the German news, they're saying that uh, Indians are marching to Quito. Are you fine? And we didn't even know that because we had no news in Vilcabamba. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, so I always saw it as a challenge, you know, more like, wow, adventure, something yeah. is going on here. So at that time, there's still, is the, is the main mode of transportation in Vilcabamba still horse at that time? Back then it was only horses yeah. and donkeys. Yeah. Uh, I know m my local friends, you know, they rode, like in a Wild West movie, they yeah. rode with a horse into the main square. Tied it, up. tied it up and went for beer, went for grocery shopping, you know, that right. was so, uh, yeah. So if I, I wanted to go then at that, at that time, if I wanted to go to Yangana, for example, or Kinara, um, I could do that in a car 
on a crappy road or I needed to get on a, a horse or a donkey? No, no, you, the, the road was already there. It was okay. a dirt road. But uh, also back in the days, uh, yeah, a four-wheel drive uh, it's, it was always a good idea and actually it's a good idea until today. Sure. You know, because uh, in the rainy season we do get some landslides and a four-wheel drive, not only here in Vilcabamba but in the rest of Ecuador too, twice it saved my life, I want to say. So Ecuador, yeah, Ecuador had, I forget the number, but it was something like six or seven different presidents essentially in the 90s um, because they kept having coups. They kept having basically the people march on Quito and they stay there until the president resigns. So we had something like six or seven of those through, I guess it was through 90, oh no, I'm sorry, 2006, right? Yeah. So it was through 2006. So I don't know if that started in the mid to late 90s and then went through 2006. I guess you would have been here for almost all of that. Yeah, time. yeah. Uh, it was like <laughs> every... Uh, one and a half years we had a new president here. It was a crazy time. Um, yeah, they are very fast in throwing out uh, their presidents when they don't like them. And it, we came in 97, they threw it. I just crossed the border from Peru when they threw out Bukaram, that yeah. was the first president I knew. And uh, then we had Ala. Coron, uh, Alarcon, then we had uh, Mauat, then uh, Noboa, then Gutierrez, uh, then Palacios. So I know six presidents in, uh, in a time lapse of seven years. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, and that led up into 2006 when Correa came to power. Yeah. And then we've had relative stability since then. Still a couple of uh, uh, what they call kind of strikes here but are really road closures and demonstrations but nothing in comparison to the old days right. before korea came into power because it was almost normal that once a month or every three months at least uh, that we had major strikes here and the whole country was shut down oh, wow. uh, by taxi drivers by bus drivers uh, by teachers uh, striking or indigenous uh, yeah and that's basically basically some portion of the population asking for change of one kind or another from, yes. from the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, which is interesting. It's so different than where we're from, right? Where <laughs> yeah. the people don't have that kind of power back home to affect change in that way, but they do here, which is, which is different. Um, a little bit to Europe. I know France, for example, they are yeah. more powerful. Their people are more, uh, I don't know the word in English, but they go to the streets. Yeah. The Germans, they are a bit lazy, you know, and they are a bit more like ob obedient to their uh, government. But I guess even in Europe or in the States, we could uh, That's make true. change some of that. if we would move uh, ourselves, you know, and do it. So what, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. No, no. What, um, what was the infrastructure like then? So we talked about the roads, but I mean, was there electricity in most places in Vilcabamba at that time? Was there, I assume there was not internet, but I don't know. Um, what was that kind of stuff like back then? Okay, well, to start, of course there were no internet because uh, internet came Right, that's in the name is Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> that in 97, no, uh, no. It was internet just on the move uh, yeah. to exist. We had a telephone office down there uh, with Doña Carmita, uh, so she rented out. It was like in the old days, you know, in the States too, you yeah. know, it was only in the grocery sh shop, one telephone, so you went there and you gave her the number and then she, yeah, uh, she gave uh, you the phone. Also very interesting. I love uh, Doña Carmita and if you see that, please forgive me <laughs> <laughs> to mention it or not, but I love her. Um, so it was uh, the only phone then, uh, everybody used it. Uh, we at the hotel, we opened in 2001 and until 2001 we had no telephone number. We needed to wait six years only to get a number, but then we had no cable up here. <laughs> so actually we never had a real phone up here, So, but thanks God it was also around the year 2005-06. Uh, cell phone towers came in and then um, connection was much easier. But it was also a changer for Vilcabamba. We, we are still talking about the facilities here. Uh, the post office, uh, we only uh, got uh, letters once a week, 
you know, I always say that uh, the postman went to Locha with his donkey and came back, you know, <laughs> and then he simply put it handwritten on a piece of paper, wrote it down and put it on the window. And once a week you went down and yeah, to see if you have a letter. So it was also, it felt very romantic to me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now at, so we had no grocery stores like now. We had two, three small tiendas. Uh, there weren't. For example, restaurants, there were only Donia, um, you know, uh, Berta, Berta was there, were two, three uh, simple eateries, La Terrassa at the main square, was you know, that then. was wow. actually the first uh, restaurant, uh, like, uh, with a Mexican food, word, uh, which opened. Um, so that was a big deal, you know, wow, we have a, <laughs> we have a restaurant. Mexican restaurant in Vilcabamba, and... Um, and if you look at Vilcabamba now, what I always tell people, because I still travel quite a lot through Latin America mainly. Mm -hmm. On Friday, I'm going to uh, go to the, Rep uh, how do you say it in English again? Republic, Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've never been there. I want to see, to check it out. But in all my travels, I haven't come across a small village, you know, in big cities, of course, uh, with the, this variety of international cuisine. You know, we have a Turkish restaurant, we have a French bakery, we have an Indian restaurant, we have a sushi place, uh, uh, almost unbelievable. Uh, we have, of course, Italian, Mexican. It's like, wow, we have Korean, we have Taiwanese, we have vegan, we have, uh, no, no, it's unbelievable for that small village. I just came back uh, this spring I, with my partner, we went to Buenos Aires. No, no, I prefer <laughs> eating here <laughs> yeah. in Vilcabamba yeah. than in Buenos Aires. So post was delivered only once a week. No restaurants so far, almost no stories, no super maxi in Locha, of course. Right. That was a big life changer for us yeah. because, um, you know, at the early uh, 2000s, when friends came to visit or family, we always begged them, please bring German chocolate or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> No, uh, traffic was much less. There were no taxi companies. Mm. Uh, I still remember the first taxis when they started to operate. They were 30 year old pickup trucks. You know, there were no regulation. Right. I still remember Don Cesar. May he rest in peace. Uh, And you always needed to hold the door, you know, uh, <laughs> otherwise it would have opened. So he drove and he was very old already back then, maybe in his 75 or something. And he was famous to fall asleep, you know, when he was driving. So you needed to grab the door and talk to Don Cesar all the time that he doesn't or well, wouldn't fall asleep. <laughs> That's fantastic. No, no. So that was uh, actually a very interesting time, very uh, different times. Um, of course, there have been changes and uh, positive changes and negative changes. And that's also very personal how one sees it. Right. Uh, I mean, life became much easier if you want to see it, much more comfortable. Sure. Because nowadays with internet, you have we have digital nomads coming here because also the internet here in Wilkabamba is better than in many places in Germany. That's right, same with the US. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that yeah. was this. Um, but uh, you asked about the hyperinflation before. Oh, yeah, the, right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, that was one of the most craziest time because um, I still do remember that I went to the bank because, um, thanks God, we, we didn't change all our money into the local currency, the Sucre. So we uh, opened a bank account at the Banco de Guayaquil and uh, already back then they had like you could choose between a sucre bank account or a u.s dollar wow, bank yeah. account so we had put it in we wanted to be safe never trust uh, sure. south america you never know what's <laughs> gonna happen here um, so we were fine because in one uh, morning i went into the, the bank to change money you know uh, so one thousand dollar in cash into the local currency and it was standing in line and I changed so one dollar to eight thousand sucre if I remember well. The guy before me, he changed it seven thousand eight hundred, me eight thousand, the guy behind me eight thousand two hundred and it hit I think seventeen thousand the same day. Wow. One hundred percent in one day. So that was maybe like almost 
probably one of the last days before yes. they closed the banks. Yeah, and that was, I think, uh, two, three days before they... First, they froze the, the exchange rate with 25,000 sucre for a dollar. And uh, then happened what they call here Feriado Bancario. Right. Bank holiday. Bank holiday. Yeah. <laughs> and they went on a long holiday. Yeah. <laughs> no, and also they... And what did that... That was like through the weekend plus a couple of days or something? How long did that last, do you recall? Um, no, no, it was that uh, they... Uh, that the banks were closed. Yeah. yeah, that was not actually not that long. But um, they froze the bank accounts. So we had, uh, let's say, our money uh, in our bank account, but you couldn't uh, withdraw it for two years. For two years? Yeah, yeah. Wow. That was for two years. We couldn't, nobody could get to their money. Um, and I know a, a German friend, she doesn't live here anymore, and understandable why, because uh, she was uh, tempted by the high interest rate of the mm, sucre. She got a CD. You, because they offered you 76% interest rate. <laughs> right. But she didn't see that the inflation rate was 100%. Right. And then the money got uh, frozen and became less and less and less and less. So she lost almost everything. Oh. Uh, no, it was two years. The bank holiday, I mean, the banks reopened. Yeah. But you couldn't withdraw your money, actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that how did, was... So how, did, how were people living? I mean, how did that... Play yeah, uh, <clears throat> many, uh, I think over 2,000 uh, companies got bankrupt here yeah. because uh, you were not in a cash flow anymore. Right. They couldn't pay their uh, Anything. The, the employees. Yeah. Uh, they didn't get a salary. It was really like, wow, I, d <laughs> I was going crazy here, you know. I'm not always cool and calm. <laughs> it was like, to my brother, but they, they cannot do that. <laughs> right. That is uh, impossible. In no part of the world uh, can they frozen your money or freeze your money. But here in Ecuador, they can do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay. So let me let me help help me understand. So there's a bank holiday. Then over my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, over a relatively short period of time, Ecuador announces that they've dollarized. Yeah. But then even after they've dollarized, your money's frozen. You can't get it out, and then eventually they had some kind of exchange rate, and they gave you access. Or how did that play out? Um, as we had uh, the bank account in dollars, we so in we dollars. had no problem of that. And actually, I don't remember very well how it worked out because we just left our money on the bank, and we asked our family in Germany to help because banks were back uh, to operation, you know, operating again. So my, our family, they wired us money to our bank account. I see. So, so we had one frozen bank account and, and one money we so can wow. not touch. And then <laughs> the new money we could touch again. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And people um, simply try to survive. Yeah. Also, sadly, and but very understandable that also crime rate, increased. you know, increased uh, dramatically. But if you lost your job, nobody's here to helping you, you know, to help you. Uh, you, have, you reach a point, even when you're an honest man or something, that uh, because this, everybody was in a crisis, everybody had nothing, you know. And so, yeah, crime rate raised, uh, that was very sad. Um, and. But also before the dollar, Ecuador was unbelievably cheap, you know, you know with the right. sucre. You know, a normal uh, construction worker earned uh, $2 a day. So it was uh, $40 a month. So that was really other times. Wow. Yeah. Right. And just for context, now your average day rate is about $20, $25. Yeah, so, uh, we are right now we are building a new apartment for midterm guests and uh, we pay uh, to the construction workers uh, $22 a yeah. day, but including uh, lunch, we give them food here yeah. in the restaurant. And uh, also our, we have like the master mason and he gets $40 a day. Yeah, yeah. yeah the very skilled guys yeah. certainly get more. Fascinating. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how the hotel came to life. So. You roll into town, you're in your 20s, you know, no carriage, but a horse-drawn carriage, you know, type, <laughs> type town yeah. in, the, in the southern Andes with, you know, Mondongo that you mentioned, about 40, 30, 30 or 40 expats currently, or at that time living here. What gave you the idea to, to, to do the, the, the hotel and talk a little bit about that story? Yeah. 
I mean, I had this idea in mind to open a beach bar. Yeah. So um, I also I not only knew that I would need the language to live in Ecuador, but also I I need money, you know, to live. And um, so very simple. So the idea came up. Um, to work with tourism because that's what I what I and, knew and about was there, backpacking. Sorry to interrupt you, but was there tourism at that time? Oh yeah, actually, because um, the the 35, 40 foreigners living here, you know, they were yeah. permanent living here. But Vilcabamba was very well known with tourists. It was okay. It was. We had more tourists back then than nowadays. Many, many more. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, we had. Was there a? Did they have the airport then? Could no, you no, fly? it was not the airport. It was backpackers. You know, it, it was, was mostly adventurous back, people backpackers. Who were backpacking South America. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it was on the route on the Gringo Trail, as they call oh, it. Oh, I see. Okay. So it was on the Gringo Trail for backpackers crossing into Peru or coming from Peru. So then the the type of tourism then has changed. I yeah, would that imagine. has changed. Because there's yeah. still backpackers, but they're not the majority. No, not anymore. Yeah. And so at that time, it was basically solely backpackers. It was, uh, yeah, average age I would say was 25 or something. Um, you hardly could see anyone above uh, 40 years or something. Yeah, it was really only the backpackers but there were average i would say of uh, 150 backpackers here in the whole valley and um, also my brother and me we had problems of finding a place to sleep because when you guys uh, came when we came and uh, we already um, uh, before we bought the property here this old farm uh, we needed a place to stay. There was no Airbnb back then. There were only uh, the hostels, and um, it was very far, hard to find a, a decent place to stay because all the more better known hostels uh, they were full booked, you know. And we thought, yeah, okay, they don't, they do need there's another some place. Yeah, there's yeah. some uh, demand here, and uh, maybe not a bad idea to open a hostel. And. Um, so there were tourists here, that was for sure. Mainly also, as I mentioned before, because of the, um, the San Pedro, the cactus. That, know, was, the that was a tourist drug. attraction. For, that was oh, the biggest uh, tourist attraction actually for Wilcabamba. That's so interesting because the cactus, so the San Pedro cactus grows all over this country, basically anywhere where it's a little bit dry and a little bit warm, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll find it certainly in this region. It's it's everywhere. I wonder what specifically got Vilcabamba on the map for that. Uh, this I don't know because yeah. when I arrived, it was already famous for that. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's not endemic to Vilcabamba, the cactus. And um, have you read about the story? Uh, you know the Johnny Love wisdom. You A know? little bit, yeah, mostly in... mostly just stuff people have told me. So I don't know how accurate it is. Yeah. Well, have yeah. you have you read uh, Gavin's book? No, no, no. Uh, something with the, the forbidden fruits of the, oh. of the or the fruits of the forbidden oh, valley. I, I, now I'm interested. No, no, no. It's a, a very um, good book if you are interested in the early history of foreigners in here. Vilcabamba. Because yeah. he's been here. Oh, Gavin! Like forty years or yeah, something. Yeah, much or, longer than yeah. we are. Um, because it was Johnny Love wisdom of uh, his order of divine divinity or something, okay. and um, they lived in Tumianuma, yeah. a very beautiful small village, yeah. and uh, they attracted also the first crowd of foreigners and young hippies back right. in the days, and so the backpacking tourism started here, and of course, you know. Uh, mid 60s, 70s, you know, hippie drug scene. So it's only my opinion. It's I have no fit. proof for that. That maybe that was the reason that they started to try the uh, San Pedro cactus here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so you you roll into town. How long are you here before you decide to to take on this adventure? You know, when we arrived, uh, it was in uh, June 98, 97 was the first visit, you know. Then I decided, yeah, I want to live in Vilcabamba, but I still needed to uh, to arrange some things back in Germany. So I had to move back. I had to explain it to my family. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and they told me, wow, you are crazy, my dad, you know. Uh, everybody wants to live in Europe and Germany and you want to go to uh, Ecuador. Yeah, But that was only a... Um, 
five minutes reaction yeah. and then actually the family helped us all the way through. Nice. So we came back then in uh, 98 uh, with my brother in June and it was a little bit more difficult to find properties because uh, there was no real estate agent here, right. no office. No. Um, if you didn't speak Spanish, it was impossible. It was really impossible uh, because you needed to walk around. You needed to talk to people in Spanish if they know maybe someone who is willing to, um, to sell. So, uh, yeah. Let, let me just uh, give an anecdote on that. So even when I got here in 2013, mm -hmm. Vilcabamba had a few real estate offices who, and they had whatever inventory they had. But outside of Vilcabamba, anywhere around here, that's how you looked for property. Like you, you the taxi drivers might know. Yeah, very Some good store cost. owners yeah, yeah. might. Some store owners might know. But basically, you just had to go into these towns and talk to people. And exactly as you said, if you, you know, if you don't speak the language and you don't understand sort of, sort of the um, logistics is the wrong word, but it's just sort of like the flow of the way those conversations go and how to go about it and what the answers mean because the communication is different yeah. here and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's essentially impossible. That was really one of the reasons we launched a real estate company mm -hmm. was because like, gosh, I, what we just went through for a year looking for property, how much easier that would be if it was online and it was standardized and there was some, you know, mm -hmm. anyways, but just, just to your no, point. No, no, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So we had to do it the old way you know because there was no way around it and uh, but luckily we only needed to look at a few places um, properties uh, before uh, we found an old farmer and he was uh, the caretaker of that place here we are sitting now um, and he was only the caretaker. The lady actually was the mom of uh, Patricio Vivanco. You know him, sure. I guess, because that's the guy with the tennis court over there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so his mom was the owner. He was the um, former finance minister also mm -hmm. of Ecuador. And uh, so we contacted uh, the mother of Patricio and um, so we could uh, directly and buy it from her. So this is, you. did you buy still in Sucre's? Yeah, that was right. still in Sucre. And if, you if, cannot imagine because it was 120 million. Sucre's, right. right. Well, I, don't answer this if you don't want to, but just for context because of how different it was. Because I've heard stories, people trading cows for properties, people trading, you know, l l items that don't have a ton of value. Yeah. Do you know in dollars? in 1998, 99, do you yeah, know like of what? Of course I know. <laughs> yeah. Is that something you want to share? Or no? It was 120 million and I want to invite you to challenge to divide that through, um, yeah, the amount of money. No, no, it was unbelievable cheap. Cheap, in the super yeah, time. unbelievably cheap. Yeah. But uh, I also, I, uh, I thought about it, why? You know, for, okay, there were no um, foreigners here and right. They sold properties uh, with a value, with an agricultural value. Value, exactly. And where we are here at Ishkaluma, they call that dry land. Mm -hmm. That means it's not, uh, um, or it's above uh, the irrigation channels, uh, the water. Sure. Re uh, re uh, yeah, which makes it have not much value. Yeah, that, that means yeah. that in the summertime, in the dry season, uh, you cannot grow here. Um, even the cows, they don't have grass to eat. So it was not much of value. And also Ishkaluma, it's like this. And uh, Ecuadorians, they prefer flat land because it's easier for agriculture. Sure. So nobody wanted to buy that land here. And we actually wanted it because of, uh, you know, the look view. around, the few. At the beginning, when we started to build a hotel, the locals here, they called us the crazy Germans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because as I told before, it was only a dirt road, no traffic. It, was, it seemed like two kilometers, so that's 1.6 miles or something out of the village outside. It's like, uh, wow, a huge distance. But we knew that uh, actually the view is unbeatable and uh, tourists will come. And uh, that was also the case, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, yeah, uh, prices uh, changed since then because um, it was, I would say it was around 2005 uh, when we had the first time that we had more foreigners 
coming, looking for land, wanted to stay in here, to stay in Vilcabamba. It was mainly because of an international living magazine. Right, they were doing a lot. They of, were yeah. doing a lot of uh, promotion for Vilcabamba. Yeah. Mike Adams as well. When he Mike was, Adams, when the he was health ranger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was back in the days. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, so they actually put Vilcabamba more on the map, not only for backpackers, because we had that before, but really for people looking for another lifestyle, I would say. Yeah. They were not mainly uh, retire, uh, for, uh, retired people. It was still like the age of the health ranger, you know, people like, oh, you also, you were young when you came here, but I'm uh, tired maybe of the old lifestyle yeah. and looking for something new. Yeah. So that was 2005, 2006. And that was then also the, the time when the locals realized, oh, the foreigners, they don't want to grow uh, vegetables there or they don't want to put a cow there. Sure. They buy the land because they like the view or they like the setting something. So then they changed the value of the, of the properties. Uh, so it started with a change of mind. They understood the foreigners better. Yeah, that's interesting. So y you would attribute that to foreign demand because I'm also curious the like Malacatos for example which is 10 minutes from here yeah. it's a little in most cases not in every case in most cases it's a little more expensive than Vilcabamba um, and I you know I've always attributed that to the demand coming out of Loja because there's not a ton of foreigners obviously very few foreigners in, yeah. in Malacatos they tend to focus in Vilcabamba but I'm, I'm curious too what when were the years when did lohanos people from loha when did they start looking at these valleys specifically specifically malacatos vilcabamba which yeah. are the you know the ones that they prefer when did they start looking at these valleys as residential valleys to have second homes because i know going back probably i mean certainly to the time you came and probably for some years thereafter these were still largely agricultural valleys um, Malacatos was mostly sugarcane. Yeah. I know at one point Vilcabamba had sugarcane, but I know Vilcabamba also did a lot of corn and beans and even wheat and tomato, different things like that. Um, at this point, there's still some agriculture here, but as you said, the land is, is priced for residential use for the most part. Um, but I always attributed that to Lojanos with, with expats playing some, some small role mm -hmm. kind of in the market. But when did that, when did Lojanos start start coming out in large numbers for weekend homes and all that kind of thing. Yeah, um, also in my opinion, I think you are not wrong. Also uh, the influence of the, of the Lojanos, um, the, uh, the people from Loja, but they have, in my opinion, uh, much more influence in Malacatos. Yeah. Why do they choose Malacatos? It's closer it's to Loja. Closer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you say 15 minutes that's or 10 right, minutes driving right. time, it's closer to Loja. The temperature is maybe one degree even warmer than here in Vilcabamba. Yeah. So if you live in Loja and you want to build a weekend house, a holiday house, so Malacatos makes much more sense. Also, that's the reason we have less Lojanos here in Vilcabamba. It's sure. simply the driving time. And uh, for example, me, I didn't know that Malacatos is uh, more expensive than uh, Vilcabamba. Yeah, the land prices tend to be slightly higher, not in all cases, but certainly like around town, close mm -hmm. to town, anything that's relatively close to the main road is ex more expensive than yeah. Malacatos. Yeah. And that's uh, due to the, the Lojanos. Yeah. yeah. But it was not until, I would say, 2010, 2012, mm. and it... In my opinion, again, it had something to do with uh, the political change here because of Ecuador, we, we got a boost when we got over this silly game of changing the presidents every year. <laughs> uh, we got the US dollar as a stability, you know, uh, things became more expensive, but also you could plan at least, you know, you, right. because we had a, a strong currency, no inflation, or very the same like in the US. And um, uh, business were th thriving again, you know. And um, during the one can like Korea or not liking him, but sure. he did a great job for Ecuador because for a period of uh, over 10 years, we Ecuador went up like this. 
in, uh, in safety, in economy, uh, you know, in social security, it was like yeah. the golden age of Ecuador. T tons of say. infrastructure work done then. Uh, the middle class were building up, you know, yeah. they had um, all what they had lost uh, during the bank holiday, you know, they gained it again and they had money now to spend. And that was around 2010, 2012, they became interested of building a weekend house, you know, mm, in Malacatos. Okay. And I think right now also is a, a, a little boom of people from Loja moving to Malacatos and that could have something to do with the pandemic. Yeah, Because for sure. uh, also they realize, hey, actually it's very nice to live in the countryside and That's not right. in a big city. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So let's jump back into the hotel story. So you've been here however long you're here. You get this idea to meet the demand of, of the tourism that was here at that time. You find the piece of land. What happens? What happens after that? Uh, yeah, we found a piece of land, and um, per, as I told, it was 120 million. I've never seen so much money because we needed to go to the bank, <laughs> and you know it was like this. They only had ten thousand uh, dollar bill, ten thousand sucre bills. Okay. So divide 120 million by ten thousand. You know how many. Uh, it was a huge amount of money you felt rich, but actually it was only paper. Yeah. <laughs> and then we needed to walk to the other bank because the banks didn't do uh, transfers in okay. between them. So you needed to go to your bank. We got the money. It was like really two bags like this. We got a guy with a shotgun yep. and we needed to cross the main square to get uh, to the seller's bank. And then there we needed to wait, you know, I, I don't know, more than two hours because oh. in the middle she needed to count the bloody money <laughs> you know, it was like and then i still remember after 30 minutes she said oh fuck. <laughs> i did it wrong so she started all over again yeah and then okay after that story that is so funny yeah uh, construction also was very different back then um, all the material um, you needed to find because there were no hardware store. If really? you wanted in Vilcabamba, you could get maybe a hammer, you know, or nails, but that was it. But even in Loja, the, they didn't have like big hardware. There was stores. no Kiwi hardware store. Sure. It was. It took forever to find what you needed. Uh, you know, you needed to go to all the different small hardware stores yeah. uh, because a hammer you got there. A uh, saw in the other one, nails here, it took forever, you know, and uh, also um, in the restaurant, for example, um, the pillars we have in the panoramic restaurant, yeah. uh, we went to Masanamaka, you know, found the fike trees, cut them, uh, the roof also it's from the, from the Oriente, close to Palanda, yeah. so we needed to drive down there, find a farmer who has those kind of palm trees, it's called uh, Chonta, uh, yeah, the right. iron yeah. palm tree. Yeah. So then you made a deal with him and he told you, okay, come back in two months because I have to cut the palm trees for you. And then two months later, we went down there and they were lying beside the main road. Yeah. Or the floor of the restaurant, it's uh, between Samoda and, uh, and Locha, close uh, mm -hmm. where the, the electricity, the power plant yeah. is, you know. Yeah. The same deal, you needed to hire to find a guide who is willing to go into the river to cut the stone for you, then you needed a... Now it was, wow. again, it was adventurous, it was interesting. There were no machines. Everything you see here was, even the swimming pool was, uh, you know, uh, uh, passed of to dig, uh, digged out uh, yeah. Yeah, by hand. Wow. Uh, no, no, it was like all the foundations, all by hand, it took forever. But again, it was interesting. Yeah. So when you when you start, so I assume then you're probably a couple of years of building. Yeah, it took us uh, three years till we opened it. Yeah. Yeah. So at that time, there's what did you what were the build what were the original buildings restaurant I assume some mm -hmm. cabanas what what the pool it sounds like. Um, yeah, the initial idea was to build something small yeah. and. Uh, Got a little bit out of hand <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over the years. No, but uh, we started, or oh, when we opened in uh, February 2001, we had the panoramic restaurants, we had only nine rooms. 
mainly for backpackers. We had a swimming pool and also very important back then the bar. <laughs> sure. Because I was 29 when we opened. Uh, so I was still very young, I still liked to party. Now I'm a little bit more slow. And uh, nine rooms. And then from, and then you, you know, so Ishkai Luma, um, it's, it's kind of remarkable, right? So I, you know, I have an entrepreneurial background. I like to kind of keep an eye, understand trends and see what businesses are doing. And there's, I happen to know, you know, kind of the hotels in this town and more or less, how, you know, sort of how their business is. And this is really the only one. I mean, I've been here 10 years. This is really the only one that's consistently, you know, not, uh, I'm sure it's not full every day, but that's consistently largely booked out that has, you know, consistent sort of loyal uh, people, you know, people that are staying here, which is, which is remarkable. And I think, you know, I think part, I think the reason that is, is just because how you guys built this place. And then also the fact that you guys, you know, you be, being German, maybe has something to do with it, but you, you guys give service. That's what you would expect, you know, c coming from anywhere in the world. So you can kind of come to this place. The prices are very reasonable. Um, you feel great here, it's beautiful, and then you actually get the, the good service. Um, and so you guys have kind of set yourselves up as kind of, you know, the hotel in town that has that business that's, that's thriving in that way. And my understanding, you've kind of financed all the growth here through operations, right? So it sounds like you were, you know, those nine rooms were profitable even, even yeah. early on and were able to get you to all this expansion, which now, how many rooms do you have now? And uh, now we have uh, 25 rooms uh, and four apartments with a uh, full kitchen. Yeah. And uh, we, yeah, also we have the tropical garden spa, we built a spa. Yeah, and it all came from the uh, income of the hotel. So it was Remarkable. profitable uh, yeah. from the beginning. Um, and actually it's not a secret, you know. We like what we do. <laughs> It's the passion, yeah. you know, uh, I never would have thought that, but uh, because the idea of building a hotel was to sustain our life, yeah, sure. but actually we, we like what we do, you know, and we do it now since uh, 23 years uh, with the hotel. I love to be around people and it's so interesting. We get uh, guests from all over the world, you know, not only the States or Canada, we have also Latinos here, we have from Europe. Uh, we have China here right now, a couple, we have Australians, we have, you know, and we have not all, only the, the different countries, also the, the range of ages or generations even, because we have young backpackers as young as 18, 19, but also we have our guests that range from also 75, 80 years old, and they are Mainly they, they like it because it's like a, a meeting point of generations to interact and uh, to get to know each other. Yeah. And um, that makes life interesting here uh, and we don't get tired of it because you always meet new people yeah. and hear new stories. And uh, we simply yeah, have passion for what we do. And I think whatever you do in life, you know, you should do it with passion or don't even start. You know, you should, you should enjoy life. Uh, Um, so now, you know, you, you've, you've kind of, you know, lived m much of your adult life here. Uh, I know you travel a good amount, but you, this has been your home base now for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, what, what keeps you here at this point? I mean, you've lived through so much change. Like this is not the little valley you came no. into at that time with horses and people tying up their horses in town and the road ending here. You know, that, it's not that place anymore. It's even, you know, in the 10 years I've been here, it's grown dramatically. Um, I would say that's increased even in the last four years, three, four years. Yep. You've seen a kind of a boom in development, which, a slow boom. It's mm -hmm. an Ecuador boom. It's not a states yeah. boom. But um, what, what keeps you here, you know, after all these years? <laughs> it's a very good question because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, yeah, I travel quite a lot and always with one eye open, you know. Um, I never 
when I arrived here in the late 90s or when it started to run or function with a hotel, I never said uh, uh, that I would live the rest of my life here in Vilcabamba because some guests uh, they always ask, you know, oh, so you're going to die here and no, I haven't decided yet. So when I travel, I always look for other places. I love Costa Rica. Yeah. Um, I love the beaches there, uh, how they treat nature. And um, it's a nice place. Um, I like other places also very much, but there is something about Vilcabamba. <laughs> Again, maybe the magic. The weather is unbeatable. Not the weather, the, uh, the climate. Yeah. Because as you know, we have some shitty days too. But they are only shitty days. After five days, the sun comes out and it's beautiful again and warm. And for example, now in Germany, we are in November. And you know, for the next five months, yeah. it's going to be live inside the houses. Uh, you know, it's cold outside. So you have five months, you must be prepared for shitty weather. And here you have, you have a couple of days and we never know, maybe tomorrow or in an hour even, it's yeah. beautiful again and you go to the swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. So the, the climate is unbeatable. I've never found something like this because as beautiful as Costa Rica might is, it's very humid, uh, it's very hot. Uh, I, I spent there two months once and that uh, hammock was rotting away under my, mm. <laughs> my butt, you know, because mm. it was too humid. So the, the climate is actually one of the strong points of Vilcabamba. Uh, of course it has changed, but when you travel, also you realize changes everywhere. All you know? the time, yeah. If I go back to my hometown, it's not the way it used to be anymore. And uh, it was maybe in the year 2002, very soon uh, after we opened the hotel, I was standing you know, above the restaurant, watching down the valley. And I told a good friend of mine, I don't want Vilcabamba to change. I want, I would like that it stays the way it is because I love it. Yeah. And then he told me, my friend, <laughs> Peter, you must be realistic because with your arrival, you already changed Vilcabamba. You know, so you cannot ask uh, for sure. the valley not to change if you actually brought with you the change. And um, I think that's even a life lesson, you know, yeah. when you look at your face, you know, you cannot avoid change. And change is not always for the better if I look into my face. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit more handsome a uh, couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, yeah, climate and uh, I like small villages. I like the local community, I like the people here, you know, I have friends here, yeah. we speak Spanish together. Maybe I'm getting too old, you know, if to start over, to start freshly new in another place. And um, no, actually life is good here, Yeah, <laughs> you know. And uh, some of the changes, as I mentioned before, are positive. Sure. Because we have so many good restaurants now here. We have uh, uh, grocery shopping is easier. I still remember years ago when I was very young and stupid, now I'm old and stupid. <laughs> um, I said also, one day when we get a gas station in Vilcabamba, that will be the day when I leave yeah, here. Yeah. Because that means it grew too much. Yeah. And now we have a gas Just station recently, here. recently, that was a big milestone. Yeah. So, 20 years it was like, uh, no, 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 please, no gas station here. And now I'm, oh, wow, that's very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. For, it's, you know, even for me, you know, less time here, less change, but still a decent amount of change in a decent amount of time. And I, I, I feel very mixed about it also, right? It's like, I love this place. I, I love it as much as I ever have. Mm -hmm. But it used to be that when Saturday and Sunday hit, and the, all the Lohanos came, you know, the, the, sound, the, the town maybe got three, four, five times bigger over the weekend. Mm. Now it might be 10 times bigger on the weekends. The weekends are kind of a zoo now. I mean, you, you can't find a spot at, that's really close anyway um, to go to the river on the weekends unless you're cool being around yeah. lots of people. That wasn't the case when I got here, you know, at all. It's, it's, a di it's definitely a difference watching it grow. And then on the other side, like you said, so many more conveniences, so many more great restaurants, great people, great you know friends, people to be friends with. Um, 
you know, it's, it's a different vibe, but, uh, but such is life. And, and so, yeah. Yeah, it was always the weekends. Yeah, many people from Loja come as a weekend destination. And uh, yeah, we, we, we got more traffic and that's a little bit annoyance. I have to say the same as you. And I uh, simply avoid weekends in the yeah. center. Yeah. Uh, I uh, do remember that actually my brother and me, we went down on a Sunday and uh, sat at the uh, main square and just enjoying the few Lojanos. Oh, you know, like more people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then drinking a beer at the main yeah. square and just watching the scene. But now you don't find a parking space anymore. You don't find anything anymore. Um, so, but also that's good for the for the, uh, the business, business the for the for the local restaurants yeah. and everything. Yeah. And um, also, uh, Vilcabamba, we have now um, a numerous uh, expat community from all over the planet, not only the states and Canada, also yeah, Europe. Um, and I spoke to some people from other parts of Ecuador. They come here for gringo watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like uh, the, all the crazy the gringos foreigners in became like a tourist attraction. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, well, and, and Vilcabamba is, you know, not in a huge way, but it is famous within the country as well. It's a place people have heard of. They know about it. The Valley of Longevity. Oh, they even if they haven't been there. Oh, it's very beautiful and safe there. You mm -hmm. know, kind of be the way people think about it. Um, before we wrap up, a couple of things. So one. Is there anything for people, most of the people watching this channel, you know, are probably, it's like Ecuador is on their radar type of thing. Maybe they've been here, maybe they haven't, but they're thinking about Ecuador potentially as an option. Is there anything you would say, you know, tips, advice, or, or big negatives, you know, anything that you, people should know or that you can think of that are, that's worth sharing um, that comes to mind and if, you know. Only that everybody's uh, different, you know, because what I maybe see as an adventure and a challenge, other people see it as scary. Uh, so everybody's different. So I think uh, if you are interested in Ecuador, you have to come and take a look and take, bring time with you um, it, um, to see how you feel, really, how you feel in the country. Um, and also Ecuador, it's a fantastic country, very small, so diverse. If you don't like Vilcabamba, you know, there are so many different climates, uh, different uh, 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 landscapes you can choose from. Uh, Mindo, close to Quito, Cotacachi. For me personally, it's much too cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, there are so many different valleys here where you will find something. You can, Cuenca, big city, yeah, if you like city life or you will find small villages. Um, and it is Latin America, you know, you have to be prepared for that. It's different than back home. Life is different here. And in Germany, for example, I have friends and we have many uh, foreigners now coming from the war zone, Ukraine, mm. uh, before Syria uh, to Germany. And what the Germans always ask is they should integrate. You know, they should learn the language, they should integrate into the German culture. The same you should do here, you know, if you want to live in a country, I don't speak that you have to learn fluently Spanish, but at least pay them respect by at least when you enter a store and say buenos dias and not good morning. Because right. that sometimes happened and that uh, annoys people, you know. That's a lack of respect of their culture, of their way of life. So integration always. So come here, take your time and travel the country. Yeah. Awesome. Anything I didn't ask that I should have that you'd like to share? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, we have our own Bavarian microbrewery. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no German perks. can survive without a good beer. Yeah. So that's the thing. No. And uh, to all the guests, yeah, um, to um, you guys who watch here, you know, you're always very welcome at Ishkaluma. Uh, maybe one thing to, uh, to add, very important because, and very strange actually, because you will not find us on booking.com or Airbnb. Uh, we only accept direct bookings through our webpage. And the reason is we want to know who comes. Ishkaluma, it's not a business, it's our home. We share, we share it 
very openly. Uh, everybody is welcome if they're nice, decent human beings. <laughs> um, so Ishkaluma is not a business, it's really the home we share and that's the reason uh, we only accept direct bookings. So okay. we will we'll put a link um, in the description below to Ishkaluma's website mm -hmm. so you can check that out. Again, for us, it's definitely our go-to recommendation if you're coming into town, whether that's for a few days or even long-term because they have some amazing long-term housing options here as well. Um, definitely recommend checking it out. Peter, thank you so much yeah. for the time. Much Very appreciated. Nice, uh, to have you here at Ishkaluma and yeah. All right. So have a nice day. Guys, if you enjoyed it, put a like, please, on the video. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the thumbs up. Any questions or comments for Peter, throw them in the chat. And we'll talk to you guys again soon. Have a great day. If you're interested in real estate properties, all of our property videos will now be uploaded on a different channel. Please click the link in the description down below.